There are some truly odd and creepy things roaming out there in the woods. Some that we know of, and some that we quite don't know. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see you made it back for another episode. Today, we're going to be sharing some creepy, and allegedly true, deep woods horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. Now, without further ado, let's get into these creepy and allegedly true deep woods horror stories that'll keep you up tonight. The first one I want to tell happened during the summer of 2017. I was working as a forester with a local power company in Pittsburgh. My coworker, we will call him Dak, and I, you can call me Luke, were working at a section of high voltage transmission lines that ran through a couple of the suburbs just outside of the city. This section was nothing too treacherous. Generally, in the suburbs, the power lines ran through backyards and small patches of woods that you could see the next road through. This section was slightly different, as it was on a hillside that was a tad too steep to build on, so it was thicker woods. Behind the shopping center, we parked, there was an open access road for us to walk down and not much vegetation to block any of our walking routes. Walking down the road, you could hear the normal suburban noises such as weed whackers, cars, and the occasional train, and even some dogs barking off in the far distance. As we headed further down the hill, we continued joking about creepy stories or imagining being abducted by the CIA because we found a secret spot in the woods. We generally talk loudly to make our presence known to anybody who may have been hunting or for any wildlife in the area. As we reached the bottom of the hill, we were walking down we hit a small bowl-like area with a lot of ferns and low-growing brush. This was not unusual for southwestern Pennsylvania, but for the city suburbs, it was not extremely common. We stopped in this area to take a break and catch up on any trees or brush that we had marked for maintenance. At this point, Dak and I had been far enough apart to where we had been communicating through our phones on speaker mode. This is where things would get a bit odd. We hung up our phones and caught up with each other in a clear area under some trees to get some shade. Generally, we sit quietly for a few moments, observing the woods and catching our breath. This time was different. We sat there quietly and was observing the woods. Seemingly, all the other noises had disappeared. It was not like it was just quiet. It was downright silent. No wind, no digs, no leaf noise nothing. We looked at each other, both feeling the same thing, but could not express the feeling in words. It was as if we were still in that area, but not at the same time. It almost was like we were watching in third person with the TV on mute. That is the best I could explain it. Finally, the silence was broken by a rogue weed whacker just up the hill from us, and all the other sounds seemingly returned. It would be okay if this were the only weird thing to happen at that moment, but as we finished that section of transmission lines, we both had to take different routes at the end. You see, the power lines went over a small 50-foot cliff, and since I was on the right and Dak was on the left, we had to go around the cliff on our sides. The side I was on had an easy way down through a junkyard full of old broken-down camping trailers. I decided not to worry about it, but the entire time through the junkyard, I could not help but sense that something, not someone, was watching me in the trailers. I began to walk very quickly, and finally ended up coming out on the main road where Dak was waiting for me. I am not sure what made everything silent. I know I have heard stories of this before and thought I would share my experience. As for the trailers, it could have just been my mind going off after a weird experience or something else. I'm not entirely sure. Anyways, thanks for sharing, and hopefully someday, someone, will figure out why this happens.
Hello there, Swamp Dweller. I just wanted to let you know I love your content, and I listen to your videos a lot, especially the ones about hunting and fishing horror stories. That leads directly to the story I want to submit today. For some background, I live in southern Germany, in a very rural area, and hunting and fishing are what I would consider my hobbies. Of course, here in the Bavarian forest, there are miles and miles of wilderness to roam, and believe me, lad, I've been around enough to tell you that where I live is quite a dangerous place, to say the least. Just give me some time to explain why. I'd like to start by pointing out that I've never been someone to believe something I haven't witnessed myself. That does not mean I don't believe in the supernatural, for I've witnessed a lot of things, some of which I wish I had not. The story I want to tell now is set in January of 2020. Without further hesitation, let's get to it. It was quite a cold breeze out there when I decided to do my first fishing of 2020. I was just going to go fishing for roach and carp in a pond not far from my house. I must admit that I eventually packed quite heavy for that day, taking a lot of extra clothing and a couple of rods, not to forget my old trusty 44 revolver, a beloved piece of weaponry, which I used to carry for more of nostalgia than feeling safe. I also took my neighbor's German shepherd I cared for while he was in the hospital. There was nothing that could harm me, at least I thought so, only to be proven otherwise. It was about 15.30 hours when I arrived at the fishing hole. Finally, having made my way through almost knee-deep snow, I tossed out my lines and started waiting. For this pond, getting few to no bites is not very uncommon, especially for this time of the year. After an hour or so of fishing without getting any bites, I decided to leave my line in the water and walk the dog a bit. As we were walking, it got dark, and I didn't mind as it was a bright full moon that night. We kept on walking through the snow, staying about 50 feet away from the tree line. From time to time, I threw a stick to him, and he brought it back. The fifth or sixth time, I threw it a bit too far, and the stick landed a few feet behind the tree line, and the dog ran into the forest. I couldn't see him for a couple of seconds, but I heard him crying. After stopping to cry, he came dashing out of the tree line right towards me. I thought nothing about it, and just threw myself into the snow, as we always used to play like that. I laid down and he ran around me a few times before sniffing my face and then speeding off towards the pond. As I turned my head to the left, I noticed there was a line of dark red liquid coming from the forest in my direction, forming a circle around me and then proceeding to where the dog ran, which meant he was hurt. The dog knew the way back to the pond, so I didn't follow him. Instead, I tried to find out why he was hurt. I went towards the tree line where the blood leads to, to be specific. I started to hear a quiet whining, and as I arrived there, I saw where it came from. I found the dog, obviously dying because of a giant bite in its neck. It, it made its last few breaths with great effort, and then died in front of my eyes. I then realized that I had just seen the very same dog in the same usual condition as it always was just a minute ago, and that thought gave me the chills and still does. To be honest, I looked up and there was what looked like my dog standing about 70 yards away from me, on its hind legs. As it noticed I was staring at it, it started running at me at an unbelievable pace. I couldn't think of anything else but just to run, and if I hadn't done so, I probably wouldn't be alive to tell this story. I literally ran for my life until I reached my house. I locked every door twice and pulled an all-nighter in the kitchen with every single light in the house on. When I went back two days later in bright daylight, I found my fishing equipment destroyed, but the worst sight was my dog's body hung in a tree, partially eaten and torn apart by this monster. I don't know what it was, but I assume it was a dog man now that I stumble upon your videos. It still haunts me today, but I'm not easily scared, and I still go fishing at least once a week. By the way, I told my neighbor his dog ran away, and of course received quite a bad beating. I'm still glad I didn't have to tell or show him the terrible truth. Thank you for sharing and listening, and be careful out there, folks.
During the summer of my 6th and 7th grade year, I lived with my aunt and uncle in the rural countryside of North Central Texas, just south of the Oklahoma border. They were living on some private property just a mile or so east of Collinsville, Texas. I would assist with the menial daily tasks and chores typical of training and tending to horses. Throughout the duration of my stay, I would sleep on the living room couch as there was hardly any room elsewhere in an otherwise large house. Roughly a quarter to a half mile south of the property are some rather small yet dense areas of woods that eventually connect to some larger areas of woods located around the Lake Ray Roberts State Park. Regarding the location of the living room couch, in a half-light door located on the side of the house, one could see straight down the southern pasture and right into those woods. On the evening of my encounter, my nerves had already been put on edge. Natural of an early teen living in an unfamiliar and foreign environment to begin with. That night, right around 10.30 or 11 p.m., there was no light outside to speak of, so reading was not really a viable possibility. Indeed, my only means of passing the time was to look out the window, right out the half-light door, immediately to my right. Naturally, as I gazed outside, I could occasionally drift off into sleep. Looking out, one would see several horses grazing in the moonlight, and one would never expect to see anything more. During one of these nightly battles of tug-of-war between consciousness and unconsciousness, I had unknowingly drifted asleep for around five to seven minutes, and prior to falling asleep, nothing occupied the land outside worth mentioning. However, in that five to seven minute gap, I had completely missed the emergence of a beast that I can only assume came from those woods to the south. I had awoken quite suddenly with a palpable sense of dread about the dark and intimidating room. And at the sound of trampling hooves, I spied over the couch arm to see the source of the ensuing commotion outside. That source, as it were, looked like what was a German shepherd that had been placed atop a black-haired covered torso of a circus strongman. The hind legs were bent backwards, and both the hands and feet ended in frightening claws. One should keep in mind that the closer this monster stuck towards the house, the more of its physical nature I could distinguish. But it was when this beast got within several hundred feet of the house, I could see the eyes that glowed a paralyzingly vivid shade of crimson. This beast must have been looking for means of hydration, as the first thing it did when it came up to the irrigation ditch was cup its hands and drink from this source of water, as a man might, rather than quenching its thirst as a dog would. This behavior was by far the most striking thing about it. Not how it skulked about the pasture or how it sat alert at the passing of far-off cars, both of which were animalistic behaviors, but rather, it was how this monster acted like a man that did not bode well with me. For roughly ten minutes I laid petrified and staring about the pasture as this beast wandered around. I would occasionally lose sight of the creature as it would move in and out of the line of vision from my position behind the window, respectively. I was certain due to the distance between the two of us no amount of me stirring would alert the beast to my presence. However, I nonetheless remained still, with no part of my body visible from the perspective of the beast, save for my head, which rested motionless atop the arm of the couch. It was not until several distant howls commenced to barking did the beast drop to a quadrupedal position. It began to gallop towards the inky black of the foreboding southern woods. I saw, from my point of view, dirt being kicked backward and skyward as the beast retreated into the direction opposite to me. Given the distance, I was surprised to hear it expel several guttural grunts every time it struck the earth below. Early the next morning I inquired the state of the pasture where I found the soil scarred and clods of dirt no doubt thrown up by the beast's massive and wretched claws. Staring into those woods where I now dare not venture any more, I crouched there, silently pondered the nature of such a monster that like a man behaved as such. And just when I dared to think that unsightly and unholy affront of nature might seek refuge in those woods, I noted how quiet and comparatively dead the environment about me felt.
I grew up in a densely forested rural area in central Virginia, and like most kids my age, 10 at the time of this story, I spent a lot of time playing in and around the woods. My best friend and I had found a creek one day while exploring different deer trails through the woods. This creek we happened on was an exceedingly rare find and the perfect spot for us to play. It was wide and deep enough to swim around in and had nice, soft, mossy banks on either side to rest on after we had tired ourselves out. The water was cool and clear, with no copperheads and no mosquitoes because the water was constantly running. We were psyched. After a few hours of swimming, we had to walk home for lunch, but made plans to pack lunch the next day so we could have a picnic at the creek banks and spend the whole day there. The next morning, we set out for the woods at around 1 p.m., planning to have the picnic first and swim after. We entered at the same spot the previous day and followed what we thought was the same deer trail. It was not. At the point where we should have found the creek, we walked into a small clearing that was covered in huge thick ferns. We had never walked past this before, so both being hungry and tired of walking, we decided to eat in the clearing. We laughed and played around for a while, spitting watermelon seeds at each other from our lunch. It was an absolute blast, and we were both in wonderful giddy moods. That all changed, however, as soon as we packed up and set back out to find the creek. As we walked, the woods started to feel darker and colder. We got skittish and I noticed my friend kept whipping her head around to look behind us. After about an hour of walking, we came up on what looked like an overgrown bathroom. There was a sink, toilet, and bathtub, all sitting arranged together and covered in ivy. It is common to find weird stuff like this in the middle of the woods, so we just walked on and made jokes to lighten the mood, calling it Bigfoot's bathroom. After another hour of walking and not seeing anything we recognized, we started to panic a bit. Instead of trying to reach the creek, we were now just trying to find our way back home or out of the woods at the very least. I told her we should follow the sun and eventually we would come upon a road or someone's property where we could find help. She insisted on another way and we began yelling at each other out of fear and let us be honest, we were little girls and we were both pretty bossy. I told her if she thought she was so right and so smart, she could just go her way and we would see who got out first. So, we split up. Now, as an adult, I fully acknowledge I was being a stubborn brat and an idiot. The worst possible thing we could have done was split up and go different ways. But nonetheless, that's what we did. Not ten minutes after splitting up, I began to hear someone walking maybe a hundred feet behind me. Thinking it was my friend deciding to go my way after all, I slowed down so she could catch up to me. Instead, whatever it was matched my pace. I slow down, it slows down. I stop, it stops. This went on for what felt like hours. The whole time I was going back and forth on whether it was in my head or if there was really something following me. I picked up a big stick, swung it a few times to make sure it was sturdy if I had to hit someone, and trucked on. As it began to get dark, I came upon something that made my heart sink into my stomach. It was Bigfoot's bathroom. I had just somehow walked in a huge circle for hours, despite me being 100% sure I was following the setting sun west the entire time. Confused and frustrated, I sat down on a log and just screamed my little heart out while smacking my stick repeatedly into the ground. As I tried to collect myself, I heard the footsteps again walking up on me from behind. I called out my friend's name as loud as I could and got no answer. Then after a short pause, the steps began to run towards me. I jumped up and booked it as fast as I could in the opposite direction. Now, this is the truly horrifying part which I typically omit while telling people this story. As I was sprinting through the darkening woods, I began to hear what I thought were church bells. I looked up to see the darkest, deepest cloud I have ever seen in my life. In the middle, it was so black it looked like it was darker than the night sky, and the dark gray around it seemed to be swirling. It gave me a horrible feeling to look at almost like nausea. What sickened me further is that I realized the sound of the bells were coming through the hole in the cloud. They were deafeningly loud. I mean really booming out of this thing. When I realized this, I stopped dead in my tracks, 
I felt a sense of absolute and overwhelming dread that was gone unmatched in all of my 24 years on this planet. Something in my head began screaming that if I did not run away from whatever the hell that cloud was, no one would ever see or hear from me ever again. I would be gone and lost to the woods. I did not want to run towards this thing chasing behind me either though, so I made a sharp right that took me away from both of them. It was now completely dark, and I was running blindly through the woods, smacking through branches, wheezing, and tripping every few feet for what seemed like another hour, until I smacked into something low and flew over it, hitting the ground so hard that all the air in my lungs was knocked out of me. As I lie there trying to recover, I realize I could not hear the bells anymore. Then my eyes adjusted to the dark just a bit more, and I realize what had just made me go ass over teeth was an old fence. Grabbing hold of it, I prayed it would lead me to a farm, and sure enough it did. I walked up over a hill about a mile back from the farmhouse, explained what happened, and the farmer graciously gave me a ride back home. I was covered head to toe in scrapes, oozing blood, and more exhausted than I had ever been in my entire life, but I was finally safe. It was somewhere past 9pm when I finally walked through the front door. My friend had gotten back shortly after we split and figured I had as well, so had not told anybody I was lost, and my family just figured I was still out after dark which was not very uncommon for me at the time at all. They were shocked when I walked in beat up and crying. Nobody had been looking for me at all. To this day, I wonder how long they would have waited to come find me if I had not been lucky enough to find that fence. I wonder if it would have ever been too late. So it was the 4th of July and my brother and I were setting off fireworks in the woods behind our house. We were passing back and forth an aim and flame cigarette lighter and lighting firecrackers and other small fireworks. It was around 2 in the morning on the 5th of July. I left to get something to drink and left my brother there lighting fireworks by himself. I get back around 10 minutes later and he asked me for the lighter. I told him I did not have it and I left it with him and he was actively lighting fireworks as I left. He says, yeah I know but I just gave it to you a couple of minutes ago. Where is it? I know my brother. This is not something he would lie about. We have talked about it many times over the years and the story has never really changed. The moon was bright that night, bright enough to see. He says he saw me in my same outfit, same face, same hair, and everything. Apparently the doppelganger never said anything, went up and put his hand out. My brother assumed it was me wanting the lighter, and he gave the lighter, and whatever it was walked away, never said a word. These were woods privately owned by my family, far out in rural Texas. Nobody else was out there, and if they were, that does not explain how they looked exactly like me. We continued setting off fireworks until about 4 in the morning, having to use a short cigarette lighter because the thing stole the aim and flame. This really happened and it was one of the most unnerving things I have ever experienced. I have not seen too many doppelganger stories around. I know this was short and maybe not terribly scary, but does anybody have any more information about them? I would love to know more about these doppelgangers. I will preface this by stating that the information I'm about to share with you is not a creepypasta or any other form of fiction. It is in fact my complete and honest recollection of the unexplained experiences I observed in and around the wooded area behind my childhood home. Other people in my family noted much of the same while growing up there, and our stories match now that we are all decades older. I'm not saying I believe in skimwalkers, sasquatches, or any other monsters as I am a man of science. I cannot ignore the lack of reliable and testable evidence in regards to such creatures actually existing. That being said, something very terrifying and unexplained lived or lives in the woods behind that house. My sister and I had just received a tent as a gift from our grandfather. He had smoked enough Marlboro cigarettes and sent in the UPCs to get a massive Marlboro tent. My mom hated it, we, however, loved it and immediately set it up on the property line behind the house. We intended on spending the night out there, 
but after about an hour or so, we experienced something neither of us can explain to this day. We saw an indentation drag itself across the tent and heard it dragging as it went. It was like a giant finger or maybe a log, something of that size. My sister cried out, and I immediately bolted outside as I was convinced it was our father playing a prank on us. Upon exiting the tent, I was greeted by nothing. There was nothing there. I searched the area briefly before grabbing my sister and going inside for the evening. About a week later, I ventured out to the tent again, only to realize it was gone. I ran inside and asked my mother where the tent was, and she replied that she had thrown it away because it had tears in it. Confused, I tried to convince myself she was lying and just tossed it out because she was anti-smoking and thought the tent looked trashy, but I fear she was telling the truth. One fall morning, about an hour before my alarm for school went off, I was jolted out of bed, but what I can only describe as an otherworldly shriek, it came from the woods. It did not sound human, but it did not sound animal either. Foxes and coyotes live in the woods, but they do not make these kinds of sounds. It was insanely loud. One evening, my father and I were up late having one of our classic all-night arguments. As we finally wrapped up our fight around 3 a.m., my father said he wanted to read a verse in the Bible in order to close on a positive note of peace. As he began to read aloud, the same or at least a very familiar otherworldly shriek boomed in the house. We immediately ran around the house trying to find what the hell made such a sound, and it even awoke my siblings and mother, who helped in such a confused search. After about a half an hour, we all just sort of gave up and went to bed scratching our heads. In my senior year of high school, I got a cat. She was an outside cat, but we would let her into the garage to sleep every night, mostly due to the coyotes and potentially bad weather and whatnot. She would always come home before she shut the garage doors because she did not want to get locked out. One night, she did not show. I didn't think much of it as cats sometimes go on long hunting, mating, and other excursions. I went and explored the area behind my house, the fields, and of course the woods. I think I found her. I say I think because I honestly couldn't tell. It looked like her, but she had been seemingly turned inside out. I stared at the remains for about a minute before turning back and going home. I know this was probably a long read, and I thank you for sharing it. If you have any idea what kind of animal, or being, or whatever, could be doing this, please don't hesitate to speculate or share your ideas in the comments down below. My family, especially myself, would love to know exactly what is in those woods. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true deep woods horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd absolutely love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton in the YouTube algorithm. If you're listening on iTunes or another podcast platform, be sure to give the show a 5-star rating, as that truly helps us grow outside of YouTube. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit that subscribe button, and be sure to turn on notifications to never miss new videos as I upload them almost every single day, and all things natural and supernatural. If you guys are on the go and don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories everywhere you go, be sure to check them out on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. It's absolutely free to download them, and always will be. If you guys would like to support the channel outside of hitting that like button and subscribing, maybe check out the merch store. I have everything from t-shirts to face masks to hoodies. I'd love to see you guys wearing some cool Swamp Dweller merch. Anyways, thank you guys as always for supporting the Swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you guys sending in your creepy stories. Be sure to send them in at swampdweller.net, and I'll see you guys soon.
with another creepy video.